Road. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this panel. Um, the panel is on African Americans and innovative Fulbrights on five continents. So obviously, you can see that we're going to circle the globe this afternoon, talking about our experiences um, around the world as as Fulbrighters, as African Americans, as uh, people of African descent not only carrying uh, our intellectual talents, but also knowledge of cultures. Many people don't understand what it means to be an American and to be an African-American um, in the role set that we play uh, as academics and intellectuals. So when an African-American steps out abroad representing the United States, it's something special <laughs> and something very important and something that we're trying to expand across um, our various uh, agencies of the United States in terms of helping them understand the importance of including African Americans in uh, its representation abroad. Uh, so this panel reflects that effort, something that we would like to see multiply and expand as the Fulbright program continues to grow. I'm Jeannie Maddox Tungara, Professor Emerita at Howard University. And uh, I'll say more about myself later, but uh, for now, uh, we will be uh, progressing along. I want to thank our panel organizer, uh, Dr. Beverly Lindsay, um, co-director of the Women's Leadership Institute at the University of California, and um, for pulling us all together. It was her brilliant idea to make this contribution to this year's 75th anniversary. Uh, of the Fulbright program. So thank you so much, Dr. Lindsay, for bringing us all together and for helping us uh, carry this message to the core of the Fulbright Association and to the core of um, what we should, we believe should be a very strong uh, policy and direction within the Fulbright program. Okay, so with that, um, I, I am going to proceed with in an order that I have of the panelists. So we'll be starting with Jacqueline, Dr. Jacqueline Leonard, followed by Dr. Beverly Lindsay, then um, Dr. Claude Louis Um, uh, Dr. Yolanda Moses, and uh, wrapping up with myself with a few comments uh, on Africa. Now, one thing I do want to um, say for those who are attending this, this panel is that it's important to understand that the Fulbright program itself um, is open to all Fulbright alums, regardless of what kind of Fulbright program you um, in which you engaged. So we encourage you all to join the Fulbright Association and to participate in its programs. And if you don't have a program where you live, think about creating one. It's a wonderful program. It's a way to stay connected to the world. Don't just wait for the annual meeting. So we want to encourage you to be active in that way. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Jacqueline Leonard, who was appointed the first African-American director of the Science and Math Teaching Center at the University of Wyoming in August of 2012. Uh, so she continues to serve there as a professor emerita of mathematics education and a principal investigator in a National Science Foundation grant called the Bessie Coleman Project. So um, she very recently had her Fulbright in 2018-2019. Um, she was a Fulbright Research Chair in STEM Education at the University of Calvary. So we're actually going to start our program uh, in North America, uh, in Canada. And she's the recipient of several awards for her leadership uh, in STEM, in, in women and people of color, and she continues to research and, and teach in mathematics with social justice and liberation as one of her main concerns. So with that, um, I give you Dr. Leonard. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to bring this research to you, and I count it a, pr a pleasure and a privilege to have been uh, Fulbright Research Chair in STEM Education in 2018. And I learned a great deal about decolonized research practices, which I will share with you. I had the opportunity to go to Canada and to be a 
Research Chair of STEM Education at the University of Calgary, and to work with some wonderful people there, uh, Krista Francis, as well as some others uh, in Canada uh, that were in the Halifax area, uh, Lisa Looney Borden. And so this research is, I'm indebted to them for helping me to carry out this project. So I entitled this particular talk, uh, Facilitating Decolonized Research Practices with North American Indigenous Students, since um, that was my interest after having worked with Indigenous populations at the uh, University of Wyoming, particularly those who lived on the Wind River Reservation. So I got a chance to visit the Halifax area and to uh, go to Antigonish, uh, where there is a Mi'kmaq community. Uh, that is a group of uh, Indigenous peoples in uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. And due to an agreement that they have, uh, the people are in control of their education system and they have collective bargaining power, which is a little different from what I was accustomed to in the United States. Um, and I actually did a little bit more research about the Wind River Indian Reservation to find out about their autonomy after coming back. Um, but their approach to education consisted of a different worldview where, college, where knowledge and culture and values are incorporated into the research practices. So in terms of decolonized research, um, they often want to resist research practices uh, from the get-go if they're not um, wanting to, um, well, they want to ensure that their voices are heard. If they're not familiar with uh, the institution or with the person, they're a little reluctant to get involved because of how they have been misrepresented in the past. And so in my work with uh, the indigenous population in Wyoming, um, relationships had to be built over a number of years before they would agree uh, to participate in research. And I found that to be true in the Canada location too. They had been in, engaged uh, in a relationship with um, Dr. Uh, Borden for a number of years. And so these relationships are important when it comes to building trust. And so respecting their culture, their language, their ways of knowing is really important. Um, and that has also come up in math education and the work uh, that Lipka has produced. So the three principles that uh, come out of that research paradigm is resistance. And that's resistance to um, any type of misrepresentation of their culture, political in in integrity, which uh, is a collaborative way of, of looking at the world and not just looking at it from the Western side. And then privileging the indigenous voices, that is giving them the opportunity to tell their own stories. And in talking with some of the indigenous teachers um, where we went from Antigonish to Cape Breton, I learned uh, at the Cape Breton School that um, they were very concerned about Western views of how uh, we see them uh, as people. And so in, in having conversations, I realized the importance of these three principles. In terms of the methods, uh, one of the methods that has been used, um, it has been uh, critical race theory in relation to uh, indigenous people, which is called tribal crit. And so tribal crit allows them to tell their stories and their narratives about themselves, their families and their relationships, particularly how those relationships uh, with the land, the water, the animals and that kind of thing are, is carried out. And so the case study was an important aspect of that, uh, that allowed them to tell their stories. And then in looking at the mixed methods um, we were able to um, be sure to make uh, to be sure that their stories were told through the qualitative design. And so children's stories and journaling uh, helped to produce some counter narratives for the work in Wyoming, which was inspired by um, the uh, privilege of being in Antigonish and Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. 
So uh, now I'm going to focus on how that work then uh, allowed me to improve my um, research methodology with the Wind River Reservation. And the, the data that you're looking at is actually a subsequent summer camp with indigenous students in Wyoming, which is based upon my experiences in Canada. And so we had um, one teacher and two staff members who identified as Arapaho. Uh, the other two staff members were white. We had 23 Arapaho students from grades four to 11. And these uh, students were, uh, they enrolled as groups of families. They did not enroll as individuals. So there may have been uh, three students that were from the same family. And so uh, in analyzing the data, rather than looking at things individually, I looked at how the family uh, unit uh, in terms of the siblings responded. And so here we see uh, one of the students engaged in an activity around physics where he was learning about uh, thrust. And um, so the air was being blown and through a straw and a, a golf ball was able to float because he was providing a force for that. So they learned about the principles of flight. They learned cartography, uh, flight simulation, safety for flying drones. We focused mostly on drones in this particular camp, uh, particularly around their maneuvering abilities and their um, ability to take video. And so when we look at the students' journals, we found that every single student, every student responded to uh, learning about drones. And so in their stories that they told, um, everyone had a, a statement about drones. And so as I shared a minute ago, rather than analyzing the students' journals individually, we analyze them as family units. And so these are pseudonyms that are uh, made up of uh, two sisters that were uh, participating. And we can see that they talked about the drones and how uh, they enjoyed flying them. But then they also mentioned the earth. And this one uh, student who I'll call Leah uh, Brown Bear, she says, the earth ain't flat. Uh, so she, she knew uh, about the rotations of the earth and with the drone and looking at um, the grasses and the buffalo and where they used to run and how maps work. Um, she was expressed not only some things about her environment, but also some principles about science. Uh, so they also learned Bernoulli's principle. And so Selena actually says, uh, as the velocity goes up, the pressure goes down. So that's something that she learned in addition to flying the drones. Um, there were two themes that emerged in terms of identity. Uh, here is um, a picture of two indigenous girls uh, at the Buffalo Jump, actually looking over and just enjoying the view. Um, but they, uh, the theme that came out was what they would call presencing where it's the right now experience. And so they took group pictures, they took pictures of themselves and, and you can see that the right now experience is actually being taken in by these two girls. Um, they also were able to enjoy hobbies and pastimes um, just like other children. And so the drone was used to track um, the, one, of, one of the boys on his skateboard, uh, but then this whole notion of community care, uh, which is a cultural uh, relevant experience as well, uh, of what happens. I saw him fall off a skateboard and the drone caught it on video, but then in a, a subsequent journal, but he's okay, he's okay, he, he didn't get hurt. So that kind of care for one another was also part of this uh, presencing as well as the uh, hobbies and pastime. We initiated a survey to look at students' um, interest, particularly in computer use, their computational thinking, self-efficacy, their science efficacy, and their technology interest and usefulness. This was something that we had given to students across the um, project, regardless of whether they were located on the uh, reservation or 
um, in after school programs across the country. And what we found when we analyzed the data was actually pretty interesting in that their computational thinking efficacy uh, not only increased significantly, but had a, a large effect of greater than one standard deviation. Um, and then the technology interest and usefulness was also significantly uh, increased. And um, this was on a, uh, a five point Likert scale for the computer use and on a four point Likert scale for the technology interest. And that was a medium effect. So um, they did increase uh, their scores on the other two elements, but not significantly so. Uh, but we were very encouraged by the results that we found. And so the lessons that we learned, uh, particularly as it drew from the Nova Scotia, uh, as well as the Wyoming uh, camp, was um, that student efficacy and computational thinking can increase uh, significantly, that it's malleable, uh, that giving the native teachers and the staff the autonomy to develop the culturally responsive curriculum for the students was empowering. And so giving them that um, up front was something that I learned from being in the Nova Scotia uh, experience that you, you provide them with the tools and, and give them the ownership and build that trust. And so then finally, um, well, third, this notion of culture in place help them to tell their stories about the communities. And then finally, uh, broadening participation uh, is important, but the students acknowledge that even though they could learn, earn large incomes being airline and drone pilots, um, that they prefer relational rather than transactional relationships. And so it's more important for them uh, to be connected to family, um, but the technology in terms of drones could be something that would allow them to stay connected to family. So that is why I think that it resonated so well with them. And I will stop sharing at this point for my next colleague to um, jump in and tell you about his or her research. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard. You brought us to the intersection of uh, technology and culture. And so uh, we appreciate that. I know that, that you're living at the intersection of technology and culture in Wyoming as well. <laughs> uh, so I'm sure that, that you know, these discussions are part of your, your daily uh, interaction. Uh, so thank you for sharing with us uh, what's happening in North <laughs> America with regard to your uh, Fulbright uh, experience. Uh, next, we have Dr. Beverly Lindsay. Uh, she has been awarded Fulbrights to listen to this uh, attendees, Indonesia, Mozambique, Myanmar, South Korea, and Zimbabwe. Okay, so she's published uh, eight books with the latest being Comparative and International Education Leading Perspectives from the Field, published in 2021. Uh, so she's got numerous articles, book chapters, and essays and such. She's co-director and principal investigator of a Ford Foundation multi-year grant at the University of California. Uh, she's a fellow of the Comparative and International Education Society, also the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So we want to thank Beverly again for her initiative and in pulling this together. And for tonight's program, she wants to represent Asia. So Beverly, take it away. Thank you, Jeannie. I appreciate those comments. And uh, Jackie Leonard, we've known each other for a number of years, certainly gave us some useful comments to think about. Uh, I will be assisted with my screen share by Manir, who will be pulling up the slides for me. Uh, you can see my title, and I'm really focusing on the issue of intellectual migration and Fulbrights, in particular in Indonesia and Myanmar. I also put at the bottom of the screen as required by universities, I did go through the appropriate research protocols through the ministries of education and through the universities uh, in Myanmar and in Indonesia. As we view the next slide, I would like for you to see the largest Islamic mosque in Jakarta in Southeast Asia. It is absolutely huge. I had never seen anything like that. Uh, that's on the left side of the screen, on the right side of the screen, also in Indonesia, where I had my Fulbright in 2013. 
I was at the commencement ceremonies for the, the students, undergraduate and master's students, primarily at the University of Lampung, which is in Lampung province. It's in Sumatra in Southeast Asia, or Southeast Indonesia, I should say. And in our next slide, which has come up, I have something special to show you. And I think you can see this. I am holding up a candle because this is a very joyous holiday period. Yesterday and today, there's a debate on when the full moon is. And on the right side of the screen, I was literally in Myanmar in October in 2017 during the full moon when Buddha returns to earth and provides information to his mother. And it's an enlightenment period. So people light literally thousands of candles. So I have my candle lit here in my office at my home. In our next slide, the University of uh, Lampung has about 28,000 students. One of the largest faculties is in um, teacher education and training. And I am actually not a teacher educator, but I was asked to be there as well as in Miek and Miek University to actually work with the deans as they are referred to and rectors rather than presidents. At Miek University, there are about 3000 on-campus students but 6000 distance education students. So there was a large group there. Our overall objectives were to portray concepts of education and public policies. This is my area of concern for a number of years. Number two, intellectual migration. We've known about physical migration, which was also discussed in the last panel that just ended a few minutes ago. But I deal with the idea of virtual migration. We don't have to move anywhere, but with our technology, we can enjoy conversations, intellectual dialogues, and address critical problems. I'll briefly discuss item three on future slides, the methodology and policy questions. Much of this came about on item number four because both countries, Indonesia and Myanmar, they almost had similar reasons for requesting a Fulbright specialist and a Fulbright senior scholar. And that was because the Association of Southeast Asian Nation, ASEAN, and the university part is called AUN, A-U-N. They want to upgrade their status in terms of quality of faculty, quality of students, quality of research. And I will briefly discuss those in a few minutes. And number five is to synthesize intellectual migration and policies. How do we view public and educational policies? I've actually written on this since my EDD dissertation and continued it through my PhD dissertation and my current book and forthcoming book, which Dr. Yolanda Moses is contributing a separate chapter, but we're also co-authoring chapters. So policies are the actual actions the, to accomplish organizational goals that are influenced by political, social, and economic or fiscal realities. And within educational institutions, they're the overall procedures and methods for program imp implementation that can be at the macro or the micro level. And this is quite important in emerging countries, often dictated by the ministries of education, the ministries of science and technology, and interestingly, the Ministry of Defense. Intellectual migration, it entails the movement of ideas within nations and porous transnational borders. You can do it by physical modes, but we can also do it by virtual modes. And most of us are quite familiar with how this type of mode or modality has really proliferated since the early 2000s and since 2020 with the COVID pandemic. The importance of virtual uh, migrate is its subs subsequent dissemination through the global higher education community, whether it's a four-year college, comprehensive research university, a medical school, or whatever. And what we argue is that there should be partnerships that are equal and not viewing other partners as junior status or evolving strictly. And that often happens in host countries when we're going into another country, 
Myanmar is really a developing nation, whereas Indonesia is viewed as a middle income country. But they are both trying to upgrade their overall university standards. In our next slide, what are the, some of the methodological and policy questions? Uh, the, the countries actually specifically requested a senior Fulbrighter. Uh, I was actually surprised with reference to Myanmar because I was written to and asked to develop a proposal. I mentioned ASEAN, which is the third bullet, which is very critical to Indonesia and Myanmar. But in particular, they were concerned with overall quality assurance, QA, in light of geopolitical regions and the standards. They want to be fully recognized outside their own countries. And this may enhance uh, the next bullet, some of the university and domestic conditions like improving the economies in, and enabling younger people. As you can imagine in many of these, both of these countries, over half of the population is under 30 years of age. So quality measures for them and the policies to implement them are very important. And I'll go to the last bullet on this page which is what are the best paradigms to meet domestic and regional specific needs and to enhance individual and, and uh, national options. In our next slide, I will very briefly mention the methodology. I did lectures, I did participation, I did seminars, I did a number of co-curricular activities. For me, both of these Fulbrights were so unique and in particular in Myanmar. I had never been totally submerged in a Buddhist culture. It's just a fundamentally different way of looking at life. Uh, there are any number of people in the United States in North America who are Christians or Jewish or Muslims, but they're not the same number of large groups and influence that you see with Buddhism. So again, I did get my clearances. It was really interesting too to go by the Dharma school where these little children were learning lessons in Buddhism and that was an unofficial part of my Fulbright. The next slide is what did I do? Accreditation was very important. For those of us in the United States, we take it for granted, whether we're in the Southern states, the Midwest or the Eastern part of the United States or the Western Conference of Colleges, schools and colleges, we do this all the time. And the ministries involve accreditation, but they often do it at the central level and they give directives to the colleges and universities. In contrast to the US, we often have input into the accreditation and standards. So I was helping them to look at accreditation really within the ASEAN context and what would be the best practices? How would they propose? So, excuse me, pose strategic ideas and plans for altering and implementing some of their academic endeavors. And one of the areas that was really important was English language enhancement. Why? Because most of the scientific literature is in English. So in both countries, the, not necessarily the students, but the faculty over 85 to 90% had doctoral degrees. They could read English, but they couldn't necessarily speak it. And at the, uh, one of the issues, the next to the last bullet on that slide is we did connect with CAPE, which is the accreditation agency in the United States for teacher training and human development. It's in Washington, DC, and you can be accredited anywhere in the world through CAPE if you go through the process. And finally, of course, I had to debrief the faculty, deans, the rectors, the university designees, and spent time at the ministries of education the Fulbright Commission and the American Embassy uh, regarding how the Fulbright was carried out and what were some of the next steps. Next. And so, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, QA, quality assurance and evaluation and research were so important. I thought it, it was very critical that I use examples from other countries in Asia. So for example, we looked at the University of Indonesia, which is in Jakarta. It is one of the major research universities in the country. And in, in Myanmar, it's in Yagon, the University of Yagon. 
we did use examples from the United States, but I was also telling them to really build upon what would be beneficial in Southeast Asia, in the ASEAN universities. The next slide. So our synthesis, one was the global sociocultural challenges for education in shifting international climates. To reiterate, the quality assurance and accreditation are so important. And we think of that in some ways with our American universities when we have students coming from different Asian countries, but we want to ensure that their bachelor's degree enables them to do graduate work in the United States or in England or wherever it is. Looks like I hit a screen. Um, the next bullet is the policy and programmatic balances between the domestic concerns in the countries and civil and political conflicts. I must say at this time, I was obviously not in Myanmar when the coup d'etat occurred earlier this year, but I am constantly in touch with my former graduate assistants in Myanmar and also a number of the faculty um, through a couple of platforms. And so I do still provide informal information to them rather than an open context. It's really important on the third bullet on that slide is the recognition of the cultural and religious and metaphysical worldviews and how that affects research and education. And a few minutes ago, Jackie Leonard also gave some illustrations of this from indigenous people in Canada. One of the points though with metaphysical points, I must say I was surprised. I really um, see the validity and religious and metaphysical views throughout the world. But as most of you know, of the situation with the Rohingya, and obviously I did not go into that area. It was in the Northern part of the country. And we were also forbidden by the State Department. But I had a number of the faculty there tell me, they had PhDs, that the plight of the Rohingyas was because of what they did in their past lives. So they needed to try to move forward in this life. So that was really formal to me. So we had both de jure and the de facto military presence. And that's what that uh, bullet says. And finally, the need for accountability and mutual transfer of intellectual migration to be beneficial to everyone. And if we will quickly move to the last two slides, this is a picture of me when I was co-teaching a, a team with the person on the far left slide, um, research methods. And it's basically social science research where most of us in our PhDs could do this. And the next slide is my speaking upon my arrival. The rector was leaving just as I arrived. And our final slide for now includes my bibliography. And the very final, final slide, I guess it did, uh, there should be one more after this. Oh, well, basically what it, it is, is I thank everybody in, um, in Indonesian, which is Tarimi Kash, and in Burmese, which is Kwa Yang Zhu Tin Barfa. So thank you in English. All right, thank you very much, uh, Beverly, for that fine presentation. Um, I just want to remind the audience that uh, they should load their questions in the Q&A section uh, of, the, um, of the screen at the bottom. Click on Q&A and load your questions. I also want to let you know that um, although we'll be uh, um, you know, reading your questions out, anyone who would like to stay over at the end of this panel for about 15 minutes, is welcome to do so and share with uh, the panelists they've agreed to stay some of your own experiences abroad so save the q a for actual questions for the panelists and save a, about 15 minutes at the end of the panel to share your your own um, experiences if you're fulbrighters your own experiences abroad so thank you for that uh, now i'd like to move on to uh, professor dr claude louis om um, thank you for joining us. He is uh, an associate professor of political science at the University of Nebraska, Kearney. 
He was awarded a 2009 Fulbright to Rostock, Germany. And his research focuses on the politics of casino gambling, race and <laughs> politics and public policy. So with that, uh, Professor, take us to Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, um, putting this together and uh, bringing us to discuss our uh, various experiences. Um, our, my um, Fulbright came about as a result of a longstanding relationship between our university or here at the University of Nebraska at Kearney and uh, the faculty at uh, Rostock University. We're located in the middle of the state of Nebraska and Rostock is across uh, the Atlantic uh, uh, off the Baltic Sea. Uh, here's a picture of our campus. Uh, and, uh, and so I actually, I uh, um, was able to go twice to, uh, uh, to teach um, um, American politics, race and politics, um, and public policy uh, in Rostock. Um, and uh, both while I was in Europe, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, as an African American who grew up in Missouri, uh, being kind, being referred to and thought about it and referred to as black was a common experience. However, uh, in Germany, I was American, and it, uh, and I and it came with a lot of benefits. Uh, you know, many families invited me over to uh, to their homes, wanted to know about our country. Uh, wanted to help me help wanted me to help them understand the politics uh, and the social and political dynamics of our country. Um, the relationship between um, University of Rostock and uh, University of Nebraska Kearney uh, actually um, began in the late 1990s. Um, and uh, Dr. Involved... Claude, yes. sorry to interrupt, but um... I don't know if you've fully shared your um, slideshow, if you want to start your slideshow, because I, we're not seeing the, if you're progressing your slides, we're not seeing it. Just okay, make, let me uh, go back sure you know. to the screen share. And uh, all right, let me, sorry about that. Also click the little computer icon at the bottom of your screen so that we can see it on the full screen. Okay. How about now? Much the, better. Yeah, perfect, we're at, we're at the, yeah, the 1997 okay. all right. slide. Yeah, perfect. great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, um, that the relationship between our university and Rostock was longstanding and involved a variety of uh, departments and programs, both in our campus and uh, um, at the Rostock campus as well. So um, the, the philosophy uh, faculty where the American and British uh, cultural studies is located, and that's also the English department, uh, has uh, played a key role. Uh, but for a number of years, the uh, Institute for Political Management uh, and Management Sciences uh, and its engineering program uh, were, was part of this partnership. Um, and so on our end, uh, the College uh, of Education, our construction management, our Department of Modern Languages, of course, my department, as well as the Office of Inter International Education, uh, were actively um, engaged. Um, so because of this relationship, uh, my uh, um, colleague, uh, well, one of the professors from Rostock came to visit um, and, uh, and asked if I would be interested in coming as a, a, a Fulbright scholar uh, for, for a term at, at, on their campus. And uh, I agreed, and uh, Gabby Linka, she's uh, a professor of British and American culture uh, and the English language at Rostock, facilitated that. But in this earlier period, it was all, not only uh, students that are, uh, were being trained to teach English at Rostock University that uh, would come here, uh, but uh, a group of our teacher education uh, students would go every summer and spend two weeks uh, there in Rostock. In addition, our construction management program had an exchange with the engineering students so that their engineering, construction engineering students would come here for a time and our construction management folks would go there. However, 
uh, a number of changes took place. Uh, uh, for one thing that happened at, on our, at the Rostock campus was that the engineering program was transferred to a different campus, a different university in that system. So that part of the partnership went away. Um, consequently, it also resulted in our construction management uh, uh, program no longer participating. Um, um, so for, for, for a time, it was principally this exchange between the respective colleges of education um, and um, cooperation between our political science department and theirs and so forth. Uh, so I went uh, uh, to Germany. I had just fabulous experience in addition to teaching. I uh, had opportunities to give lectures, uh, to be guest speakers in different classes, uh, both in the political science department, but also in the American um, cultural studies program uh, as well. Uh, upon returning from um, uh, my time in Germany, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Gabrielinka, contacted me because uh, our College of Education, uh, facing some budget cuts and some other uh, challenges, uh, decided to end its participation in the partnership. Uh, and uh, Dr. Linka asked me if I would uh, uh, kind of be the coordinator for this modified uh, uh, relationship. So for about six years, I served as a coordinator. Uh, and what that, uh, those six years involved every July, a group of four to six uh, students from Rostock University who were um, uh, going to be teaching English once they finished their bachelor degrees. Uh, there at Rostock would come and do their practicum at Meadowlark Elementary School here in Kearney, Nebraska. Uh, in those years, Meadowlark was one of the uh, schools that had an alternative uh, uh, calendar so that the students would arrive in July. You know, most schools are not in session in July, but for a number of years, Meadowlark uh, was uh, in operation year round uh, under the alternative. So the students were able to come in July and do their four month practicum. And as part of that um, uh, 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 relationship and, and that program, what I did was, yeah, all the logistics of getting the students there, working with my colleague, uh, Katja Smith uh, at University of Rostock to uh, do the logistics of uh, getting the students here, um, uh, making sure they got uh, from the airport in Omaha because there's no direct flights from, from uh, uh, say, uh, Berlin or uh, any other major German city to the middle of Nebraska. So that was always part of the logistics. But in addition to helping them get here, um, I assisted in working with our university administration to getting them into student housing, into uh, um, our computer system, as well as making uh, arrangements with uh, uh, Mark Slutty, who was the principal uh, at Metal Arc Elementary. So, um, so that, yeah, so as part of that uh, dynamics, uh, uh, you know, for example, one of the things was uh, in Germany, you know, most people, my, in, in Rostock, Germany, most students don't have vehicles. As most of you know, uh, in uh, rural America, there isn't really good public transportation system. So we had a, a, a program of, uh, we had a series of bicycles that we had on campus that students could use while they were here. And it was their main mode of transportation. Uh, and of course, as the coordinator, I uh, was on call to help them uh, whenever a problem arose. Uh, and for, uh, for, for 2010, 2011 through 2016, um, that program facilitated between four to six students from Germany coming and doing their uh, uh, practicum here in, at, uh, at Metal Arc. Um, and in addition, as part of their visit, um, I 
help facilitate um, uh, uh, them being able to audit classes here at the university, uh, ability to visit classrooms, um, not only our German classes, but any class that the students were interested in. And given that they were all uh, teacher education students, uh, they spent a lot of time with our colleagues at the College of Education, uh, who was very, uh, continued to be very receptive and, uh, and helpful to the students. Um, in addition, uh, each summer I um, facilitated some cultural activities, be it a barbecue, where I invited faculty, community members, and um, UNK students to come and meet so that they could have some uh, connection to the larger community. Uh, as well as some trips to, uh, for example, we went uh, on a, a canoe trip down, down the Niobrara River one summer. Uh, another summer we went to Colorado uh, for a Colorado Rockies game. And one of the memories I have about taking the German students to this baseball game was, uh, I think there was five of them that year. And as we were walking from um, where we had parked the van to uh, the stadium, each one of them independently came and said, are we going to be okay? Because, you know, in Germany, uh, soccer games are very intense uh, uh, situations where the opposing fans can sometimes get beat up. <laughs> I'm like, no, uh, American baseball fans are passionate, but not like that. So uh, we had a one wonderful time. Um, so, um, so I did this for uh, about six years and I also recruited, um, uh, and mostly this, this relationship and my role in facilitating and continuing this program grew out of, grew out of my uh, incredible uh, level of support that I received in my time in Germany as part of the Fulbright program. Uh, as I mentioned, it was on, not only the, uh, 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 my colleagues, uh, in the English department and the teacher education program there at University of Rostock, who were not only kind, invited me to dinner, took me to the beach, but uh, we had wonderful, wonderful, rich intellectual discussions about a whole variety. But even many of the students uh, who are in my lectures and my seminars there, uh, their families and friends extended just wonderful welcome. And as a result of that, uh, uh, the support I had gotten, I uh, volunteered for those six years to coordinate the program after uh, the institutional resources uh, were, were, were eliminated as a result of uh, budget cuts. So, uh, and in fact, even after my term as coordinator, one of my colleagues, uh, 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 a lecturer in our music and uh, modern languages uh, uh, departments, uh, agreed and continued uh, and, uh, to, uh, to be the facil facilitator of those student visits. Uh, Francisca Breck uh, did that for a couple years. Um, so for about eight years, as a result of the Fulbright, uh, students, groups of students were able to come not only to do their practicum here in the middle of Nebraska, but also to have some pretty rich and diverse cultural experiences uh, as well as strengthening their English skills uh, uh, as part of completing their uh, educational um, uh, training. So uh, I think that uh, Fulbright was clearly uh, uh, made this possible, uh, both for me and for uh, the students from the University of Rostock. So, so th those, those are, so uh, I think uh, the program uh, does a number, a number of things, but uh, the relationships that it fosters, I think, is one of the key uh, key benefits. Certainly, that's been uh, the great the big benefit to me, as I'm still in contact with and friends with uh, uh, my colleagues at the University of Rostock. So, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Luiom, uh, for that uh, wonderful perspective on uh, what it was like to be an African-American in Germany, of all places. Thank you very much for that. Sure. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Yolanda Moses. She currently serves as professor of anthropology uh, and is former associate vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and excellence at the University of California, Riverside. 
Dr. Moses' research focuses on broad questions of the origins of social inequality in complex societies uh, through the use of comparative ethnographic and, and survey methods. So she looks at gender and disparities in the Caribbean, in East Africa, and in the United States. Um, so she, uh, I'm rushing along here, but please uh, refer to her bio uh, in the Fulbright database. But I do want to say that her Fulbright was to Australia in 2016-2017. Um, and she is also um, a AAAS Fellow, American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellow. Uh, so Dr. Moses, let's hear about Australia. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, are you all seeing that? Not yet. Okay, though. Here it comes. Okay, so um, hello, everybody. And I'm learning quite a bit about um, what, what everyone else has done. And thank you so much for having me. Um, my Fulbright presentation, I'm not sure where that green line is, what that's for, but okay, ignore it. Um, originally, my field work was, in, in, as an anthropologist, I was a Fulbright chair in anthropology in a center at the University of Sydney called the National Center for Cultural Competence. And I'll tell you how I got there. My original uh, research was to look at similarities between indigenous people in the US and Australia around issues of um, integration, uh, particularly in higher education, because in addition to being an anthropologist, I was also university president at one time and so the whole idea of how to bring populations into higher education was important. Something I really wanted to understand and I wanted to understand it in a cross-cultural way. Um, and so I started to look at First Nations people in Australia and to get some understanding about who they are. And if you were to map those languages across the continent of Australia, you would see the hundreds of languages that are spoken by Aboriginal people there, um, but how invisible they are in higher education and, on the, and in the landscape. So that was something I was really, I really wanted to look at. Um, I wanted to do this comparative history on colonial sell, settlement and systemic racism because there were two um, genealogies that we share as Americans and Australia, that is, we have this British um, history. And uh, there's this uh, uh, literature about the global color line and, and how whiteness traveled with the British empire wherever it went. And so that included us, of course, in the US, but also Australia with its, its, uh, its history of being a colon, a penal colony uh, that they declared terra nullis, that is there was nobody there when they went there, which of course there were people there, obviously. <laughs> and um, uh, the, the idea that not only were they there, but they had been there. And you can see in Australia, there was a continuous presence of people over 65,000 years. And that's the longest of any cultural group of homo sapiens ever. Um, in the United States, it's 30,000. Well, they both have settler colonial histories. They were both pushed off their lands. Um, they were both, quote unquote, brought into civilizations or were tried to be civilized um, through religious education, kicked off their land. In the US, it was Trail of Tears, broken treaties, and both in the 20th century of, uh, and the 21st century stereotypes that are naturalized. And as anthropologists, I'm interested in what does that mean? That is, what is the narrative that people use to say, well, these people can't be like us, right? There's something about them that makes them uh, totally uh, different. So um, I put in my first proposal, 
to, to study this. And um, I was denied. <laughs> and I was, my proposal was uh, accepted by the US Fulbright folks, but the Australian Fulbright Committee said no, that they didn't want that. So, and we'll talk about that in our discussion if you'd like to. But I did, had done some more reading and I realized not only were there indigenous to indigenous similarities, but Aboriginal people identified with Black people in the United States. And that there was a history of relationships between Aboriginal folks and Black folks that started in the early, in the 60s. Um, and there was actually um, an article, if anybody wants to read it, called Malcolm X and the Aboriginal Black Power Movement in Australia in 1967 to 72. So there's a genealogy there that I was really interested in and wanted to explore because that was not my original, um, uh, that was not my original intent. So the second time I applied, <laughs> my proposal was accepted and that's what I wanna talk about uh, for the rest of the time that I have with you. And this was one that focused on what does diversity and inclusion look like in, in cross-cultural perspective where we're, where we're looking at a model that um, is a whole of institution model. So the whole of institution model means that diversifying the university and bringing the value of diversity into the university for all students is not just the job of the chief diversity officer and those people who have, have diversity in their job titles, but it's the entire university. The University of Sydney had, um, had started to do this and they wanted someone to come in who was a senior scholar. So I came in as a distinguished chair in cultural competence and they had established a national center for cultural competence at the University of Sydney and wanted me to come in and look at the work they were doing and to help them think about how they could do a better job of uh, creating an all of university model that would allow them to bring in indigenous uh, students, uh, diverse students from other parts of the world and to do a better job than, than they had done before. So for me, uh, the idea was to take the kind of piecemeal way that we have done diversity in the United States and say, okay, if we were able to do a whole of university model, what would that look like? So in the National Center for Cultural Competence, um, there, there was a, a vision about how this should happen and resources to tackle that, uh, a systems approach, if you will, and part of this had to do with training people, part of this had to do with moving people around, part of this had to do with uh, bringing in models that hadn't been there before. But the idea of cultural competence is, was the centerpiece of their intellectual model, right? So what I did was to gather data on the impact uh, on the study objectives, the impact and the use of the cultural competency model and its implication for Sydney as a whole. Um, how is it being used? Uh, how did people understand it? Uh, where, were the, where were the pitfalls? Where were the outcomes? And the methodology I used obvi obviously was anthropological and social science, uh, looking at their archival literature, the in-depth interviews with key people. And that was key people on and off campus because the University of Sydney is the oldest university in, the, in Australia, and it's one of the most prestigious, and it is located in the original site of where the original settler, the original explorers came and met, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, Aboriginal folk that lived in that area. So it has a particular history. And of course, it was the first time me, five years ago, had heard 
oh, how do I say it? Ceremonies, when they start, you honor the land, uh, the land on which we build our university and you name the people and what have you. And I had never heard that before. Now it's something that I, I hear a lot more in California, but at that time I thought, oh, this is really interesting. How does that translate into action and into work? So I spent a lot of time in the Red Fern community, which was the indigenous urban community around the university, talking to people who had been there and uh, looking at their engagement with the university. And there was an agreement um, that the university had with the Aboriginal community about how they were going to do, how they were going to do that work. Uh, <clears throat> focus groups uh, of people there in the city, but also in the outskirts, because a lot of the Aboriginal students, and the population was only about 2%, would come into the city and leave the areas around the uh, state that they came from. And a lot of times they were very lonely and there had been on that campus, a center for the longest time is where they congregated. But when they moved to this all of campus model, one of the first things they did was to do away with that center because now taking care of Aboriginal students was everybody's business. Well, of course, what happened is that everybody didn't do the work. Didn't do the work. So, uh, exploring the components of cultural competency, demonstrating what works and what doesn't work, addressing the gaps in ascertaining the needs of all the students for all the background. What happened is we found out that they were falling short of doing what they wanted to do. And why was that? Well, part of that was resistance from the model as, as it was. Remember I told you it was the oldest University there started in, in 1857, I think that was the year. Well, there are some very rigid ways that um, the organization was set up. And just by saying we want to do all of campus model did not work. I mean, it, it, it just didn't work. It was a good try, it was a good place to start. So uh, we, my recommendation was that you go back to step one, <laughs> phase one, step one, and talk to the uh, students, talk to people. And one of the things we found out is that people didn't know how to do that work. They needed themselves to be um, trained. Many of these folks were white and hadn't ever had any contact with indigenous students before. And then all of a sudden they were to be their uh, guides. They were to help them. They were to bring them in. They were to help them to be successful. And this is both at the undergraduate and graduate level, not to mention the fact that uh, they also wanted to hire diverse faculty. And I thought this is very similar to the United States. And so we started looking at leadership models and then we started putting accountability models in place. And then we started monitoring what was working and what wasn't working. Um, I was only there for one year. So obviously this, is, this work is ongoing. Uh, as a result of that, I have met colleagues who I am in touch with at the University of Sydney, at the University of Melbourne, um, and several, several other universities who are trying to put in place this all of campus model because the piecemeal model, uh, it doesn't work, is not working. So cultural competency has kind of shifted to um, saying, it's one thing to be culturally competent. How do you implement that in your work? And how does it change your work? and how are you rewarded for that work? Uh, so rather than diversity uh, and inclusion being a, something you do on the side, it has taken 
a lot longer to integrate that value in the, in the middle. So rather than a, a, a visionary plan and a strategic plan, there is now an accountability model with goals and measurements and outcomes for meeting those goals or not meeting those goals built into the system. And uh, also as a result of that, there are graduate students now who want to become, uh, who want to do this work in their uh, professional fields, the School of Veterinary Medicine, the School of Business, um, School of Environmental Studies. These are places where the graduate students, not just Aboriginal graduate students, but the model of bringing in cultural competence and using the worldview of <clears throat> indigenous folks and actually hitting on some of the, the viewpoints that the first speaker talked about, right? It's sort of like empowering the people who are in the university to, to help with university change. I was a researcher, yes, but because of my administrative experience, I was called on to do a lot of other administrative things that I didn't think I would be doing, right? Uh, and one of those included having the women of color on that campus. And these were Aboriginal women, these were uh, Asian women, these are Torres Strait Islanders, these were people from uh, New Zealand, come and say, come and ask, talk to me collectively and individually about how do we empower ourselves to push back against a system that is not um, noticing us and our contributions. So I did a lot of informal kind of leadership training and um, that was something that I hadn't, hadn't counted on before. So this is by no means done or finished there are graduate students from University of Sydney who have applied to come to the University of California, Riverside. Uh, Stephanie Gilbert, who uh, is writing an article with me, will be in that book that uh, Beverly is publishing. Uh, she is, was a postdoc uh, Aboriginal woman in the Fulbright program. And so she and I are collaborating on that and some other projects. So I would say this is an ongoing project um, for me, and hopefully it will be helping that university, but other universities who wanna do this kind of work, both in Australia, but also back in the US, where we are having our own issues with creating um, institutionalized uh, diversity kinds of processes. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Moses. You know what we say about the Fulbright, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yes. So <laughs> your, your, your ongoing research in Australia and um, the outreach that you've had there and re your relationship with the people there shows that it is an, indeed the gift that, that keeps on giving. Uh, okay, we only have a few minutes. And so I am the, the last continent uh, to be represented here, and I'm going to make it easy. Uh, Yolanda, can can you stop sharing? Yes. Your screen. Let's see, how do I do right. that? Uh, there. Yeah, there you are. All okay. right. So uh, I will now uh, share my screen. And I'm just going to uh, very briefly share a few photographs from Cote d'Ivoire. My, my research was in, in Cote d'Ivoire as a Fulbright Haze. So it was a research award. And I went with my daughter, and she was able to go uh, with me and go to school for an entire semester in northwestern Cote d'Ivoire in an area called Ogine. So what you see here are just a few of the uh, photographs that um, or out of that that area. So I mean, this was a, a lot of time on on dirt roads and sitting in mud huts. These are from um, a village of of um, potters and, and iron workers. You know, people mostly talk about the iron workers, but the work of the women potters 
you know, when we think about all of these pots and everything that they held and all the food that was cooked in these pots, you know, so these women were very important. This, the focus of my research was was uh, on the Manding state. There was a 19th century kingdom that came together there. So the focus of my research was on the Manding state and um, the ideological <coughs> foundations of the state. So I went around to, to villages and I largely collected songs because my problem was how do you find out how people learn about their own cultures? You know, what is, what is the, the public representation, you know, that people hear, that they experience to understand what their own culture is about? So as a, as a result, I collected uh, songs and, and oral traditions and went to the center of Manding culture. These are man, Manding peoples. Um, in the U.S., you may be familiar with the term Mandingo. Well, these are people who come from a broad swath of the Western Sahel. Um, so, and they are Manding speakers. So I was with this group in uh, Northwestern Cote d'Ivoire, um, exploring uh, this culture and looking at ways in which they broadcast their culture among themselves. So I did interview a lot of women. I went to a lot of Islamic villages as, as well founding villages. Um, there were ancient things there dating back, you know, to the 19th century. Uh, and that was what you saw in the previous. He actually had the, the this was in Mahandiana. He actually had the, the uh, shawl of, of like the Islamic person that had at first come into the village. And so those uh, precious artifacts belonging to, to that person, you know, were kept uh, in this way, in this um, pot, covered pot. And that's how they, they preserved uh, those uh, antique uh, items. And this person, the Imam was also, you know, had his talibe, you know, his students, you know, that were studying with him and learning the history and culture as well. So those are just a couple of shots from a couple of villages to show the nature of my research. And the, the last uh, photo I'll show here is one with um, uh, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson when she actually came to the United States. Um, and why do I end with this particular one? Well, you may have seen it on some Fulbright literature in the past, uh, the Fulbrighters uh, Association and um, the State Department liked this, this photo, but it represents so very much because from my work in Cote d'Ivoire, and I actually taught at the National University of Cote d'Ivoire for 10 years and then went back to do this research after I relocated back to the United States. But um, what, what it represents for me is this, what I talk about as a gift that keeps on giving, because in addition to, to my work uh, in pursuing these lyrics and oral traditions and coming to understand very profoundly this, this manding culture and what's important to them in their own language and how that translates into many of the things that I saw because I continued to write about the politics, about issues of land tenure, about uh, Ivorian women uh, and, um, and carryovers even into the African diaspora, okay? Because what I found was that there were some foundational issues within that culture that were reflected in African-American culture. So I continued to uh, research those issues and to write about those issues um, after I returned from the Fulbright, but also to be involved with the State Department. Um, I, I participated in a USAID assessment, a five-year assessment in 2015 in Cote d'Ivoire, but it's, it's the, the effort to, to bridge what's important on the American side with what's important on, on the overseas, and in this case in, in Cote d'Ivoire, with the African culture with which uh, I was engaged. This ultimately led to, I'm retired now, but it ultimately led to my involvement with the Andrew Young Foundation in supporting an American style university uh, in Cote d'Ivoire that is seeking US accreditation and to participate in bringing together a board that will raise a substantial endowment to ensure the financial stability of that institution, the International University of Grand Bassam. So um, I, I'm going to, to stop there because um, we haven't taken any questions from our audience yet. I think some have been answered uh, directly uh, through the Q&A. 
but uh, if anyone has any questions at this time, uh, would you please uh, put them in the Q&A section? Um, let's see, we've got, uh, well, what, two minutes, and then we're going to bring an official close to the panel so that we can hear more from those who are in attendance with us today. Um, but I, I wanted to ask um, the panelists, um, how did this Fulbright experience impact your community or your work environment? upon your return. I mean, I think we all kind of say that, you know, when we have these experiences abroad, we're not the same people. There's also a reentry experience <laughs> that we go through when we come back from from overseas. So, I mean, what do people see in you and how do you feel that this experience impacted your environment upon your return, whether it was your church, your neighborhood, your your PTA or <laughs> or your, your academic institution. How do you feel that this experience impacted your environment? Um, uh, Dr. Leonard, you wanna take a shot at that? Sure. So um, as Dr. Lewis Sean shared, uh, when we go abroad, we're actually seen as Americans and not as black Americans. Um, and then you come back and you have to get reacclimated to that whole paradigm of how people see you <laughs> uh, and, and get readjusted to that. But in terms of my own change, I saw the struggles of the indigenous people differently. Um, it, they were no longer a group that I just wanted to research and write about, but a group that I wanted to learn about and to become closer to as an individual uh, when I heard uh, that, you know, they were poisoned with the uh, smallpox blankets as part of an extermination, when I heard about the residential schools and how they were mistreated in Canada, it, it made me reflect upon uh, their humanity in a different way, that they were no longer subjects, uh, but they were people with a common struggle, not different from our own as African-Americans who have uh, from the diaspora struggled for 400 years to uh, you know, be seen as human. Um, so this whole humanity thing uh, helped me to give up, <laughs> so to speak, uh, the ownership of some of the research and to just give it to them to hear what they had to say. And a couple of the questions that I've answered already about the curriculum, it was an indigenous ecological knowledge system that they wanted to incorporate into uh, the drone lessons. And then why were their voices important? Their voices and their stories are important. Their ways of viewing and seeing the world and knowing is important. Their uh, cultural ways, their agricultural ways, as we know from the beginnings of this country, that they saw the um, Europeans as friends, helped them to learn how to grow crops and that kind of thing. And so their knowledge of the land, of agriculture, of science is important. And we need to acknowledge that. Um, would anyone else like to weigh in? How do you feel that your home environment was impacted by your Fulbright? Sure, I, I can say a little bit. Uh, probably the biggest thing that stood out to me, and I still um, talk about this with my students in my classes, because you know we continue to fight over in the uh, public policy arena over assistance to uh, you know pregnant women, um, uh, single mothers, poor folks, and one of the things that really stood out to me uh, in living in Germany, my office mate. Uh, got a year off with pay after she had her first born son. Uh, and then uh, when she came back to work, her job was still there. She continued to be an incredibly productive uh, scholar and teacher. Uh, and so sharing those stories about how um, Germany seems to be able to provide a significantly um, um, uh, stronger safety nets for uh, all its citizens is uh, a practical 
lesson I learned that I continue to uh, share and point out uh, that there are better ways to, that we could treat each other and be with each other through our public policies. So, Thank you very, very much for that. Um, would anyone else like to weigh on that or shall I ask you another question? We've got something here in the Q&A. Um, it's coming from Catherine Mahood, who's asking, she says that uh, there was a panel um, yesterday that, that said that indigenous cultures have a lot to teach us about solving climate change issues. And so she asked, how do we integrate that knowledge? And thank you so much for that, because uh, on the Council of Foreign Relations panel yesterday, you know, I told them, I said, look, you know, Africans are planting things like trees, like cashew trees that are creating microclimates, okay, in the Sahel, all right? We were worried about the advancing desert and here we are now with a cash crop of cashew trees creating a microclimate and they've had more rain than they've ever had before <laughs> up there, you know, in this northern portion of Cote d'Ivoire, you know, where they were worried about the encroaching desert, okay, no more. There are even cocoa trees now that people are beginning to plant further and further north, all right? And so I was telling these people, I mean, the panel had a lot of, you know, hotshot people with a lot of money. That they were managing, you know, with with uh, the carbon, you know, business and all that. And I said, can't you guys take some of your money and invest it in the developing world and things that are already working for them and making a contribution <coughs> toward these issues of climate change? So, in any case, enough from me. Let me hear from someone else. I see a lot of nodding going on there, Dr. Moses. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we suggested that they do at the University of, of Sydney was to establish um, uh, positions called um, uh, faculty of practice or you could call it whatever you want to, but to create spaces where you bring people in from the various communities who have expertise in doing just what you're saying and put them in front of students in capacities of leadership and and honor that knowledge that they that they have and <clears throat> figure out so students can see that you can be on the cutting edge by listening to what has happened in the past that has worked. That's one thing. The second thing is actually going into the communities with the community's permission. Uh, we had a, a field trip that was a class, an engaged uh, field trip, anthropology field trip, where students went into the Northern Territory and they were, they were actually guided by indigenous folks who had grown up in that area as kids and every single plant and every single watering hole and every single thing in that environment had a use and a purpose. And they were talking about how how, how it helped them over time, weather droughts, deal with fires, all the kinds of rages that are happening in our environments. These folks who've been there 65,000 years have gone through that and have figured out how to do it. If only we would listen. Okay, anyone else like to weigh in on that? Okay, we have a question from Lauren Hershey. Um, she, you know, this was one of the questions that I had on my list as well, and that is how do we get more voices like, like ours, Black voices, um, into the policy areas regarding the Fulbright programs? How does she say it here? She says, um, Lauren Hershey in the chat here, she says, uh, she's talking about Senator Fulbright's principles through his serving as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee through his books and speeches. Now is the time to lift our voices to be heard more broadly. Okay, so that's uh, what she puts out there. So how, what kind of impact can, oh, sorry, Lauren, it's a he, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Lauren Hershey, it's a he. Uh, so how can we um, do that? How, you know, what do we have to do? to increase the, the diversity. And, you know, African-Americans, yeah, we need to be out there. 
you know, people around the world have watched this experiment with African Americans, somewhere between 12 and 15% of a population of some 300 million people, and we have impacted the history of this nation undeniably. Okay, this is an experiment that uh, minority ethnics around the world have watched, and some have even imitated in their civil disobedience and their efforts to gain more attraction within their communities. So ours is certainly a story worth telling, and the experience with African Americans abroad is critical. But the question now is how do we get the Fulbright programs to recognize it? And I fought for this while I was at Howard, um, you know, saying, look, it's not enough for the Board of Foreign Scholarships to say, oh, okay, we have a diverse pool. Oh, we're widening the number. And then we let the people overseas pick who they want. Well, no, you know, we have to mold those selections so that students from HBCUs, so that African American students wherever, so that Native American students, so that Asian students, so that we do indeed represent the broad section of American society. It's like not just the Ivy, white Ivy League students who, and students coming from the prep schools who should be getting Fulbrights. Um, Beverly. I'd like to make several comments. One, I can share this on the chat, but I just had an article published on Tuesday about the passing of, Sen of Secretary of State Powell. But I also discussed in there ways that African-Americans and other BIPOC people should be involved in Fulbright's and other international programs on all continents. That's why I was so keen to have this, pre this uh, panel because we represent everything. The second point that we also need to be, and I'll share that as I said, the second point we really need to do is to prepare our students that regardless of demographic background, they should be able to apply anywhere. Uh, Jeannie, you've probably heard some of the black ambassadors talk about the black belt. They get, and every part of the world is important but we shouldn't only be in Africa and the Caribbean. So to get our universities and the boards and the embassies in other countries to be receptive to our going everywhere. I was the first person in certain parts of Asia, uh, particularly in Indonesia, which of course is the third largest democracy in the world. And they were eager to have me. The second, uh, the third point is for those of us who are going and particularly our graduate students is to have that fully integrated into their doctoral programs. I was fortunate, I did not have a Fulbright when I was doing my first doctorate, but I had a Ford Foundation grant and I had a postdoctoral fellowship. So I've actually been going to countries continually since I was 22 or 23 years old. And I have tried to share that. A final point I will mention, when we are in country, and I didn't talk about this today, but I had a Fulbright in Zimbabwe. I was in Zimbabwe at midnight, team teaching my graduate doctoral course at Penn State so that the students from both countries could interact and talk with each other. So they can see these PhD students in Zimbabwe are just as bright as the PhD students at Penn State. When I had my uh, Fulbright in Mozambique, we also did something similar. And I published uh, in another book earlier with one of my colleagues from Mozambique. He had been the Dean in one of the faculties there. So I think it needs to be done on certain levels. And the final, final point I will make is to help the, Jeannie, you and I have talked about this, the board itself, not try to pigeonhole us. My it's first Fulbright Fulbright. was, yes, in full, not only in Fulbright, but other international grants. My first Fulbright was to South Korea, okay? You don't normally see black people getting Fulbrights to South Korea, but I was very receptive to submitting a proposal and it was funded. Ironically, the two of my Fulbrights that were turned down were South Africa and Jamaica. You know, well, the other thing we have to know is that we have many of our students who are going to China. You, when I was in China, I saw several African-American students who are part of various types of programs from high school through college, right. okay, in China. And these young people speak Chinese, including my nephew, who was in uh, Taiwan 
for two or three summers in a row. Um, so can um, Munir, can you help us open the platform now so that we can see our audience and if everybody can sort of unmute and, and yeah, let me uh, let me first off though I just want to uh, share the um, the uh, the next the morning session so that everyone knows so that if people do head out um, that they know that the next session will be tomorrow morning at 9:30 a.m. Post affair number two, education, COVID-19, and mental health. So, um, but now, um, anyone who's in the audience, uh, we're going to bring you in as a, as a panelist. So your video and audio will be available. Um, so just know that that would happen. But it will prompt you, so you won't randomly have your video turn on, you know. So anyway, so I'll go ahead and do that um, right now. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to add something on top of what Beverly says, and that is, if you, if, if we want to change the way the Fulbright operates, then we have to become leaders in the Fulbright program at the leadership level. So if you have an opportunity to be on a board or to be nominated for the board, if your voice is not there, things are not going to change. Or, you know, so you can't assume, I, I can't, can't assume other people are going to speak for me and are going to speak the way that I speak. And it's being in on in a leadership role, you will have more influence. And I'm going to say social media can begin that process, just as Beverly talked about connecting her students. Mm -hmm. We can strategically use social media to bring to bear change. Um, by focusing on certain initiatives or proposing certain kinds of initiatives and just being a presence. Okay, if you want to share an experience, uh, unmute yourself, tell us your name and your affiliation and share some comments. Ellen Anders, are you unmuted? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, I, I thought it was a wonderful presentation. There was so much here and so much of it was new to me that it'll take a while for it all to sink in. But I did identify with the lady that was talking about the Native Americans in uh, Canada, because I too had a, a Fulbright in Canada at the, um, it was in uh, Alberta. And I was in a school that was, uh, it was a detention center and 90% of the students there were Native American. And just being around those kids, I learned so much. And there were so many rules for them that they couldn't do that, that they were very restrained in many ways. But one of the things that I just wanted to say that I learned is that they, the people who work there said, oh, these kids don't talk much. Don't expect them to talk to you. Well, you get them by yourself in a room where nobody else is there. They chatter like every teenager. They learned not to say anything in front of whites because it was not going to work. But what I did learn from them is how they did learn to communicate. And that was through their eyes, their eye contact. And the girls were swift at it. They were so good. But it taught me a lot. I mean, there was so much more that I learned. But yes, uh, even within our own country, there is still this form of discrimination. And it, it's, it's a sad thing, but it's being worked on. Great, thank you. Dr. Uh, Stacy Nixon, you've unmuted. Yes, I've unmuted. I just wanna, it, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. As a member of the Fulbright board uh, and one of two African-American members of the board, I'm, I'm sorry, of four. Um, I would just like to thank you for this exemplary presentation. And I hope that our young African-American students can gain the opportunity to know that there are so many of us out there that are representative of their goals and values and that they should aspire to the Fulbright. And I would like everyone to know that the association is doing all that it can currently um, 
to promote this so that more African-American students have the opportunities that we have had to be scholars in other countries and how that, that broadens our vision and, and enlightens us and allows us to bring things back to our families and communities that we otherwise would not be able to bring. And I just wanna thank you all. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for chiming well, in and sharing. I'd like to say something. I, I remember when I was a Fulbright, I mean, when I was a graduate student, Fulbright opportunities weren't as broad as they are now. So they have broadened and, and you can be an artist, you can be an unaffiliated person, you can be a professional. There are short-term programs. So I think that if we can get that word out there in those environments in which um, uh, people of color are, they, they will say, oh, well, maybe if I can't take a whole year off, I can definitely do three months or I can definitely do the summer. Yes. Just knowing that the range of opportunities over there would be, I think, very helpful. For uh, the student Fulbrights, because you know I oversaw that program at, at Howard as well as the, the faculty program as campus rep. Um, but for the students, um, I found that they need a lot of help with their proposals. So as yeah. Fulbrighters yourselves, you know, whatever affiliation you have, would you please reach out to whoever's coordinating your program and volunteer to help a student with, with their proposals? They need, they need that help, they need that feedback. So your experience, I, that's what I did when I was at Howard. I called on former Fulbrighters and, and other international um, scholars involved in international work, and I assigned them a student to help them with their proposals. Uh, and that made a, a huge difference in the number of Howard students that were able to at least make the first cut. Allison has her hand up. Oh, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. I so appreciated the panel and um, the wisdom shared. And I am a fellow board member with Dr. Stacy Nixon on the Fulbright Association board. And the I agree with everything she said. And I was going to say something else, actually, but Dr. Tangara, I, I'm curious. I wonder if we can do something as an association to organize um, alumni to be available uh, in the way that uh, alumni, for example, help with college essay writing, help call, uh, high school students and the like. I wonder if we can organize more formally to be a resource for students uh, across the country who, who would benefit from, from having just an alum even cheerlead as they write their proposal and go through a, a complicated process. Um, the only uh, other thing I just, I just wanna say, you know, I so appreciated the comment about no, of course, no one, uh, it is important to have your voice heard and to be a presence on boards and in places of power and positions of power, no question. I ask myself what I can do as a, as a mother, first and foremost, who wants her children to be in a world that is enriched by the dignity of other people's experiences. And um, I find myself really sensitive to the way narrative has been played out in our history and shaped. And I have been for many, many years baffled by uh, the negative narrative um, around the African-American experience. I understand the roots of it. I understand the poisonous effect and intent, but I, from the time I was a child, look around and I, I see another narrative. And what's happening more recently is an opportunity that we have to validate a narrative of endurance, resilience, triumph, um, resourceful community, support, success. And we are, in our country, I feel like we're, we're facing an either or choice of either you take the narrative that 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 suppresses the pain, the pain of other of, 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 of especially certain groups experiences, or you open up to this multi voice narrative that leaves people wondering what where our patriotism is and our loyalty and so on. And I think that maybe 
a role we can all play for each other is to bridge that false divide. And, you know, because right now, as I go through this pandemic in New York City with children in three different public schools, and uh, I take great strength the more I learn about the African American experience in this country. And it's a story and a narrative and many stories and many narratives that can give us all strength as Americans and a greater ability to represent us as a country abroad. I see loyalty and patriotism in that. And I just wanna throw that out there um, and thank you again. Well, thank you for, for your comments. Um, I had a hand from Harris, Datsun, Nichols, and then Williams. So if we can just go in that order and, and wrap up our discussion with those four and feel free to weigh in on what you've heard um, in any way that you wish. Okay, so Muriel Harris, are you still with us? I am, yes, good afternoon and um, hello everybody. And thank you, thank you so much for those presentations. Um, I was in Ghana in 2015-16 for a year at um, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And I'll say that one of the things I have done since I've been back is work with students. And in the last year, I've had two out of three students actually have Fulbrights combined with their dissertations, actually. So this person, um, somebody made a comment earlier on about thinking about doing it that way. And um, one is actually in Ghana right now doing her, um, her um, Fulbrights, and another one is, is waiting to go to Jamaica <clears throat> um, in a couple of days. So yes, um, I do like the idea of mentoring. And if you can start some sort of mentoring program to help students, because I know how much support I had to give those um, three students as they put in their application, um, all the way to um, getting to the point where they were meeting with the representative on campus. So yes, I think that's a great idea. If it's something we can do, I'm sort of more than happy to be a part of that. Um, and thank you all for your presentations. I think this really sort of enlightening and, and gives whoever, everybody's watching a sort of insight into what um, options they are and variability is in, in um, Fulbright Fellowship. So thank you, appreciate it, and um, look forward to working with you. Thank you, thank you for that contribution. W. Dadson, am I getting that right? All right, good afternoon everyone. And uh, afternoon. thank you very much. And a uh, happy birthday to the Fulbright Association. All right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all of you have done a magnificent job, and I want to thank all the panel from yesterday to today. And where's Dr. Yolanda Moses? Excellent. On my screen, she's right underneath you. <laughs> yes, I can see her right there. <laughs> you and uh, Dr. Be uh, what, Dr. Beverly Lindsay, and uh, another, where is she? Jacqueline Leonard. Jacqueline, yes. The, your study of the native and uh, indigenous people is actually very, very uh, enriching. Um, but apart from that, I was a full bride to Benin and Benin, Benin and Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm from Ghana. And I learned a lot when I went there. So when I came back to Lincoln, I started the study, start putting, uh, pushing forward the study abroad. So I've taken students to Ireland. Mm -hmm. To Spain and uh, what what called Namibia, so I think that is a good. I said, for me, I took out a good start, but uh, I did not include a full bright in that type of process. So, uh, as we said, we need to educate our people and also be able to start something uh, of one, including our students in a full bright studies. And I hope that. Uh, the, the black people will be able to start the, this association as a, as for the black association, so we can encourage them in addition to work with the Fulbright leadership. I don't know whether that's possible. I'm just putting it forward. Okay, excellent. Thank you for, for Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my, the next on the list I have, uh, Nicole, Sharon Nichols. Hello. Thank you so much for a really wonderful, wonderful session. I appreciate it so much. I had my uh, Fulbright in Malawi. I was there for a full academic year. This was in the 1980s, so long, long time ago. Um, it's just wonderful to know that there are so many other places in Africa that have been engaged in the Fulbright program. And 
right now, um, for the last three years, I've been serving on the Travel Task Force. Uh, we have a new name uh, recently, but Fulbright offers the opportunity to travel to our alumni, people that have been uh, Fulbrighters <coughs> and friends uh, for opportunities that, but we've mainly been in the European countries. We did go to Malawi a few years ago, and I'm just thinking of all the connections I'm hearing about the African nations. We need to get those on some trips to Africa for our, our Fulbright alumni on our agenda. So if you're thinking about reconnecting with where you were or initiating something new with a location, get in touch with us through the, the office. They can make connections with the um, travel group and we can explore that. I think it's once we get the world opened up again after the coronavirus issues are over, uh, there'll be a great deal of interest uh, in identifying one or two locations over the next year or so, two years, three years, whatever it takes uh, to expand our travel uh, program for alumni. Excellent, thank you for that contribution. So let's keep that in mind guys for the next travels. Um, let's see, Regina Williams. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I, I wanted to say good evening, but it may not be evening where you are. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of it international is. participants. But um, I do want to say that I've really enjoyed what I heard. Uh, it's evening here in Cleveland, Ohio, where I am. And I'm the president of the newly reactivated um, Northeast Ohio chapter of the Fulbright Association. And so, uh, thank you. <laughs> but uh, we have uh, over 100 members, about 103. Most of them are, are lifetime members. And emerita uh, and emeritus faculty, but we have young professionals as well, about a half dozen. And so um, I heard what someone said about getting the young people engaged and letting them know that Fulbright is within their reach. I also want to speak a word on behalf of the part-time faculty because I was there for about seven years. Once I was advanced to candidacy, I started teaching so much because I needed the experience and the money, but of course that cut into my time for research. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was surprised when I lived in the DC area about three and a half years ago, how many part-time faculty were unaware of the fact that they could apply for and yes. receive Fulbright fellowships. And, um, and it was really interesting for them to be right there, you know, in the heart of the Fulbright world and, and that the woman from Cleveland was telling them how to do it. So I enjoyed that a lot. But again, to get uh, part-time faculty and other professionals, I, I think you did mention that, especially for the Fulbright Specialist Program, again, for two to six weeks, I, I'm on a Fulbright Specialist list right now. I'm hoping that I'll be able to go to Canada before April 22nd, when my name is gonna come off that list. But uh, to do all that we can in working with the alumni and part-time faculty and students, as well as the full-time tenured faculty members who might be able to get that sabbatical for a semester or the full year. I, uh, and I say that because when I was doing all that teaching 25 years ago and didn't think I could find time to breathe, let alone go to a foreign country, it's people would talk about Fulbright in my presence, like it was out of my reach, okay? Uh, I didn't get my first passport until I was in my 40s. Oh. And I went to Beijing, you know, three times before I got the first Fulbright. So uh, again, just to talk about the program in such a way that people know that mm -hmm. it's not impossible, you know, to qualify. Mm -hmm to call yourself a Fulbright scholar. And, and you need to teach, you know, you have, can't just be a, a competent teacher. Somebody's got to write that recommendation to say that you're an excellent teacher. At least that was my case. And so, yeah, I'm hoping that we will um, let the part-time faculty know that that's one of the things that's within their reach as well as reaching out to our younger colleagues. Thank you. Jeannie, could I, could I make a quick comment? And this came up in our coffee hour yesterday that I was hosting. What we need to point out is that there are multiple types of Fulbrights. Even the specialist program, as you indicated, can be two weeks, 
but it actually can be much longer than six if the host university is willing to keep you there. They're administrative Fulbrights. They're the students Fulbrights. I had students in my doctoral uh, classes at Penn State from Cyprus, from Indonesia. So it's, it's many different uh, Fulbrights and that's what we need to keep in mind. One other quick point, Fulbrights is the focus of this discussion, but there's also the Boren, they're the Trumans. Those are all within the state department as well. So if a student doesn't get one particular one, that doesn't mean they can't apply and professionals for the others. Yeah, the critical language. Yes. Uh, that's award the true. Let's mm -hmm. not forget that. Exactly. Uh, the other thing that one of the difficulties in getting a Fulbright has to do with having institutional support. Yes. Overseas. Don't forget that we have our international scholars here and their affiliations are listed on the website, at least they used to be. You know, uh, everybody who's coming in from overseas is attached to some US institution and faculty member. So you don't have a direct contact to them. But what I've done or what I, I did when I was um, campus rep and um, administrator of the student program was to email the person because you know there's a little brief description of what their field is and where they're from and all that. I emailed the person and sent it to their contact at the university, because all of us within the university, we all have um, email addresses listed uh, on the website of the university. So the host scholars name is there, so you can write to the visitor via the host scholar and i'd say you know i have a faculty member or i have a student who's interested in going to the country you know of the fulbright uh, visiting scholar that you're hosting would you please forward this message we would like to engage with them and learn more about how to engage their institution so that we would know where to send the proposal mm -hmm. and to what name and what email at that institution so we could get buy-in for the student or for the faculty member you know, for that institutional support abroad. So that's just one of the, the techniques that, that I used to try to help my faculty and students get those letters. We should also keep in mind too, that if you're willing to be flexible on location, as part of my National Science Foundation grant, my doctoral assistant and I, who's American, we went to the Fulbright Commission in London and the director there told us getting a Fulbright to London is like getting a position at Harvard. Why? Because everybody wants to go to London. Everybody didn't want to go to Indonesia like I did, South Korea. So also be flexible in where you're willing to go. Yeah, so those are good comments on how we can help our students, our colleagues. Um, so any case, it's uh, 651. Does anyone have anything critical they'd like to share? We'll have a comment from one more person. So as they say, I, I have Lauren, one. Lauren Hershey wants to speak. Uh, unmute, please. This is kind of tough to get in on. You know, my <laughs> full point was in India, 1968-69. Uh, just before I left, or well, actually a year before I left, uh, Martin Luther King came to our university and spoke. I still remember the full 45 minute experience. Um, before I embarked for India, there were two assassinations, one of MLK, the, RF, the other of RFK. <clears throat> and you'll excuse me if I start to get tears in my eyes because I'm thinking back 50 three years ago. So this country is moving slowly, but Fulbrighters are pretty smart. And I posted a comment. I urged that a board committee be set up to explore all the options. You have great ideas, don't let go of them. Coalesce, get a caucus going, um, promote influence with Capitol Hill to keep the budget span the budget. Um, that's what I'm going to leave you with. Uh, yeah, Lauren is a he. <laughs> <laughs> we know and, that now. And uh, somebody told me it came from the French Laurent. Yeah. And when the English started conquering France, they said, we're not going to spell it the French way. We're going to spell it the Scottish way. 
And then they modified it from L-O-R-N-E to L-O-R-E-N. That's what I've been told, but I can't vouch it. <laughs> anyway, I thank you all. It's fantastic commentary. And you have so much more to offer. Be forward looking, not this year, three years out, five years out, and uh, make your voices heard. And thanks very much for your presentations. Jeannie, okay. could I make one quick comment? Sure, of course. Jeannie, um, Yolanda and I have a Ford Foundation grant. And one of the things that we did is we had Fulbrights in Australia, in Myanmar, in Indonesia, in Mozambique, uh, et cetera. So we brought people over, the women who were our potential leaders. So that's one of the multiplier effects that you can also have. And I know that Yolanda is constantly in contact with her colleagues in Australia. I am in contact with everybody but now, basically except Zimbabwe. I haven't been in touch with people in Zimbabwe recently, but it is a multiplier effect. So if you have another grant or another kind of option, you can draw up on your contacts through the Fulbrights. All right, well, I think um, I wanna say, give a shout out to Munir, who was our, <laughs> our handler on behalf of the Fulbright Association. Thank you for helping us and uh, bringing in the community to, to share with us tonight. We appreciate that. That was a special request. I don't know if, if every panel got that, but I think we were enriched by the extra time and the opportunity to do that. So we thank you, Munir, for making that possible for us, along with Alicia Montague as well, also the Fulbright Association. Thank you very much for that. So for everyone who attended and who bothered to stay around and, and share, we thank you. The Fulbright Association thanks you, and we look forward to seeing you on another platform. Thank you very much and good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.